Only was the first to catch sight of the Owen for Minori leaving for the courtyard. Reluctant to interrupt them, yet still unwilling to leave them alone, Koji and Omi ended up watching the whole thing from the shadows. I do. That asshole. Though the exchange, Omi was clearly itching to jump out and punch Minori in the face. Knowing her temper, Koji kept firm hold of her arm until the end. If he hadn't, she might have very well have done it. Fuminori leaves after Yo, his every step seeming to take an act of willpower. Koji sighs heavily into the once more empty courtyard, but the bitter taste in his mouth will not go away. What's wrong with him? Even Koji can't forgive Minori's treatment of Yo, however, the first thing he feels is confusion, not anger. Koji has known Fuminori since long before college. Fuminori was never this cruel before. There is no question that the accident changed him. Koji. Are you just going to let this go, Koji? I don't want to. But what can we do? Something besides watch. Omni shouts, her face red with fury. Fucking woman. I won't be satisfied until I give him peace of my mind. That won't make Tsukuba feel better. That'll make me feel better. Wow, and think of yourself. You and Omi are best friends. Just like Koji and Fuminori. In fact, it was the relationship between Koji and Omni that brought the two together. Omni's anger is only natural. I'm going to talk to him alone. You don't have to come. Are you serious? Take care of Yo for me, will you? She's probably really hurt. She'll need someone to be nice to her after she's done crying. Wait, shouldn't we switch jobs? You know how I am. If I try to comfort her, it'll, I'll only make it worse. Yeah, you've got a point. Wow. <laughs> hey. Anyway, just go easy, okay? Any conversation before Omi's mood gets any worse, Koji heads off to find Joe. Flesh! I feel awful, miserable, but also refreshed. I finally crossed the line. I knew it would come crashing down like this sooner or later having become unable to feel anything but disgust for other people. There was no way I could hope to maintain the relationships I had before the accident. Today's incident will definitely get back to Koji and Omni. Everyone will be convinced I've had a mate. Oops. I fucking right click all the time. Ah, oh, major, major change of character. Honestly, I don't care anymore. At least I probably won't be committed for that, for this. I just need to avoid acting any stranger than I already have. If this puts a rift between me and the others, good. The thought of all the stress I'll avoid brings a smile to my lips. Fucking hell. Oh, there's a high text button. Oh, it's spacebar. <laughs> it's like that. They don't care if they make my gut turn just by... Blah, fed up with them sticking their nose into... Oh my fucking god. I'm gonna put my mouse down. It's like they don't care that they make my gut turn just by seeing, being near me. Been terrified of them until now. Today I struck fair into one of them. In that sense, somewhat of something of relief, but I'm not entirely without remorse for what happened. The person I just demolished, demolished was the verbal equivalent of a nuclear bomb. Wait, <laughs> the person I just demolished with the verbal equivalent of a nuclear bomb used to be my friend Joe. If my senses don't believe it, my mind accepts the theory. I don't have any particular grudge against Joe herself, and I didn't want to hurt her. In retrospect, perhaps I should have just ignored her outright. Yo was an attractive girl. I certainly didn't think bad of her. To be honest though, I was kind of annoyed when Koji and Omni tried to stick us together. Felt like they were toying with me. And Yo seemed totally oblivious to the fact that she was down to the turn. Ugh. Her cluelessness was irritating. So I knew that one of them... Still, I knew that none of them meant any harm. Back then, I didn't have any reason to hurt others just to get my way. Having a casual relationship with Yo would keep our circle of friends together. I was willing to make that compromise. Now, however, there is no room in my heart for such forbearances. Forbearance? If merely talking to someone is an ordeal, then how can I expect to show them kindness? These ruminations have left me exhausted. I want to return to Sire as soon as possible. Thinking about the packed trains and crowded downtown streets between here and home saps my spirits. Catching sight of a nearby bench, I sit down and close my eyes to the horrors of the world. I can't do anything about the stink or the noise, but at least I can calm my nerves enough to rest. When I regained consciousness in the T University Hospital Ward, the world was as dark as it is now. 
I had not yet recovered my sight, even though my eyes and optical nerves were undamaged. It must have been an after effect of the accident. Blindness was a shock, but now I know that my suffering then was nothing. After all, my senses of hearing, touch, taste, and smell were all fine at the time. The real horror began when my sight returned. The one small mercy was that I was able to come to terms with the accident and my neurosurgery while still blind. I panicked when I first saw the nightmarish hospital and the blood curdling shapes of the doctors and nurses, but I soon guessed the cause. It chills me to think of what might have happened if I recovered my sight along with my consciousness. Suddenly awakening and that can only describe as hell, I would have no doubt lost my mind instantly. Soon my disorders spread to my senses of touch, taste and smell. As it turns out, sight exerts tremendous influence over the other four senses. The taste of my food, the feel of my bed sheets, the fragrance of my get well flowers all became an unbearably foul or became as unbearably foul as my eyes said they should be. Eventually, when even the doctor's voice became unrecognizable as human, I decided to kill myself, and then believe for a second that I could live in this new world. At least not until I met Sire. One night while thinking of a painless way to die, I found myself succumbing to sleep, drifting between the nightmares and my dreams and the nightmare of reality. I didn't notice her into my room. Ayo. Next thing I knew, there was a face staring down at me from next to my bed. Yeah. The face was not covered in pus or slime or earthworm-like feelers. It had smooth white cheeks, round eyes, a lovely little nose. All things I'd never expect to see again. The face was that of a girl, undeniably human, and positively glowing with beauty. Smug little shit. Ha. <sighs> I sighed in admiration, savoring the first peace and joy since regaining my sight. She had not expected such a, re a reaction, apparently. Aren't you afraid of me? She asked. Looking at the clock, I saw that it was exactly three in the morning. No time for a young girl to be alone in the hospital. Perhaps she expected me to mistake her for a ghost. But I would not have cared if she had been a ghost. Either way, she was a godsend. Who are you? What are you doing here? Saya, I'm looking for my dad. I assumed that she was the daughter of a late shift doctor or another patient. It was unusual but not unthinkable for a girl to be wandering around the hospital. It's no fun if you're not scared. <laughs> fuh, 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 you scared? <laughs> Wait! I cried, desperate to keep her from leaving. It was only after she turned around that I realized I hadn't thought of what to say next. Nani? Nani? Oh my, what? <laughs> Her beautiful eyes drew me in, healing my soul to its core. Though the white haze clouding my mind, I struggled to form a coherent sentence. I shouldn't do this to a girl, but you're the only one I can ask. No longer concerned with propriety, I let the world I let the words come out as they will. Blah. Will you let me hold your hand? Well, that's fucking gay. So I looked confused at first. Her smile was brighter than my memories of the sun. You're strange, she said, holding out a slender white hand. No one's asked me anything like that before. Everything's flesh except her. So carefully, as though catching snowflakes, I placed my palm against hers. I could feel her human warmth and the softness of her delicate fingers. She was there, just beyond the palm of my hand. Thinking back, think back on the joyful tears I shed then. I know that this is the moment I will save from my fate. It's the first time in weeks that I've touched someone and felt them as human. Can't touch anyone else. I was in an accident. The side effects of surgery. I can't see people as human anymore. Hmm. How mysterious. You're interesting, she said, winding her fingers gently around mine. Can I come back tomorrow night? Yeah, of course. But isn't it dangerous? Don't worry. The night belongs to me. Flesh walls and beds. And I right-clicked again. And so our rendezvous began. So I came to my room every night at 3am, skillfully taking advantage of the duty, knife's sh dirty duty nurse's shift change. I saw she learned the fact she was living inside the hospital. So big that I never run out of places to hide, she said, answering my surprise with a nonchalant, nonchalant smile. 
She'd been living in the suburbs with her father, she told me, till one day he'd suddenly stopped coming home. After she had tired of waiting for his return, so I decided one night to sneak into, to sneak into the hospital where he had worked, and there she had lived for over two months. She was in for his whereabouts all the while. Don't you have to go to school? Huh? Dad told me everything I need to know. I'm really smart. She was a strange girl. On one hand, she looked and talked like an innocent child. On the other, she was remarkably self-reliant and at times exhibited a sharp intelligence and deep knowledge that many may have found unsettling. I didn't care. So I was the only other human in a world gone mad. Her existence meant far more to me than the standards of society. Aren't you worried you might get caught? Nope. I don't have to worry about food here. And it's a lot more fun than staying in Dad's house by myself. I looked through the patient lists and found ones who have mental problems. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sometimes sneak into their rooms late night and scare them. If they raise a fuss, no one believes what the patient say. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> That's not funny. But it's kind of funny. They just brush it off as a bad dream. Her confession reminded me that the hospital was famous for its ghost stories. Could have imagined that there was actually a real girl impishly roaming these hallways. So that's why you came to my room the first time. Yeah, sorry. Are you mad? While her pranks are hardly praiseworthy, I couldn't bring myself to scold her for the very thing that brought us together. You shouldn't do it anymore. Will you come talk to me instead? Yeah, that's more fun for me too. I can return to previous- oh wow, that's actually really cool. With extreme care, I was able to conceal my sensory disorder. It was glaringly obvious that the doctors had nowhere to cure me. And the fact that I'd undergone a still experimental procedure made me even more cautious. As a medical student, it was easy for me to imagine how the doctors would react if they discovered that I was exhibiting such unusual side effects. It's not about to become a guinea pig, a mere specimen to be examined with clinical detachment. So I hid my discomfort and loathing behind a mask of normalcy, convincing the doctors that any signs of stress were merely a result of hospitalization. Saya was my support. Looking forward to her nightly visits gave me the strength to endure my daily torture. Hope can make an enormous difference in a patient's progress. With the aid of my secret nurse, I recovered at a pace that left the doctors stunned. On the last night before my release, I summoned my courage and asked her, Are you going to stay here forever? Yeah, I couldn't learn anything about my... Fuck me. But it's not like I have anywhere else to go. Guess I'll stay as long as I can hide. In other words, she had no reason to stay. Why not stay with me? I asked timidly. The question took all the courage I had. Yes, little girl! Come live with me! Huh? My family's gone, so I have plenty of room. You don't need to hide. And it's not a bad place to live. You want me to live with you? I was too afraid to ask her what she thought of that, so I hastily offered it to you. In exchange, I'll help you look- fuck me. I'll help you look for your father. I'll find him no matter what. I think that's going to be hard, Saya said, looking a little embarrassed. It's Halloween. Dad probably did something bad and had to leave the hospital. We can't get the police involved. We have to be as discreet as possible. Do whatever it takes. I have to control myself. I finally spoke the truth. I can't be apart from you. At first she looked, but what? Fuck me. After a few moments of silence, she said, Give me a little time. That night, she left my room earlier than usual. On the day of my release, I managed to smile as I accepted the hideous, foul-smelling celebratory bouquet. The flesh beasts calling themselves Koji, Omni, and Yo came to pick me up. Though they had come to see me many times during my stay, it never got easier to see my friends change so horribly. My sudden tears of desperation, of despair drew suspicion, but I managed to explain them away as tears of joy. We walked to Koji's car. Desperately, I looked desperately for side with the grossest scenery. Even as we drove away, I kept watching the hospital fade into the distance, praying for a last glimmer of hope. But Saya never appeared. After coaching the others dropped me off, I paused for paused a while to regard my surroundings. I had lived my entire life in, on this block, in this house. There was no other place that I could call home. But nothing was as I remembered. As I walked up the path to the front door and took in the yard where I'd spent my childhood, 
feel those memories being defiled by the twisted, festering shapes around me. Inside the house I found nothing familiar, nothing to offer me comfort and warmth. What I once called how what I once called home was now a whole other world. I have no home. I whispered with a smile of self pity. There's one last stop to make, one last nail to hammer into my coffin. I stepped into the room that had crowded me from childhood. The worlds were papered with human entrails, the bed a tangled mass of worm flesh, but none of that mattered. There, curled up on the bed like an abandoned cat with Saya. I stood there in shock. She looked up at me, and a tiny, weak voice said, Can I really stop? How sad she looks. I responded by sweeping her into my arms, embracing her tightly so that she would not escape. Saya did not resist. Okay. Oh. I was expecting more banging. When she arrives at the Saki Saka house, Omi first takes a deep breath to calm herself. Her anger does not vanish entirely, of course, but at least now she can heal her, her herself think. While waiting for a response from the intercom, she looks over the patch of yard that she can see from outside the gate. Even Omni doesn't want to complain about other people's housekeeping, but this is going too far. The grass is growing wild and there are piles of dead leaves scattered everywhere. Doesn't just look unintended. It looks like an uninhabited ruin. It's still light out, but every window has its storm shutters tightly sealed. I may guess that they've been closed since this morning. What kind of life is Fuminori leading? And if he's living alone, he can't neglect his housework forever. And, it's just, and is it just her imagination? Or does something stink like rotten meat? It couldn't be coming from the yard, could it? There's still no response, so she presses the buzzer a second time, and a third and fourth. Finally, after this has gone on for over ten minutes, I mean, loses her patience and opens the cover of the intercom. As she expected, the power has been disconnected. Perhaps Huminori has a good reason for shutting the out the world, but Omni can only see it as a lack of respect to others. Anger rekindles, she pushes the gate open and stomps through the yards of the front door. Given the state of his intercom, she doubts that Huminori will respond with a knock. So Omni decides to simply open the door and go on shouting. The door, cause the door is locked, she will have to, surprisingly, the doorknob turns easily in her hand. Enraged, Omni finds herself throwing the door open wider than she intended. Her nostrils are instantly assaulted by a choking stench. <laughs> what is that smell? <laughs> Omni stands petrified on the threshold, a cowbell hanging on the door. On the inside of the door chimes loudly a moment later. Oh, oh god. Omni can't believe her ears. The voice she just heard could not have been human. Yet its intonations were too complex for any animal she could imagine. Is someone there? She calls out to the end of the hallway from which the voice came. There is no response. Instead, she hears the sound of something soft and wet flopping its way deeper into the house. <laughs> Finding it difficult to place a meaning for image to the voice she just heard only stares blankly the empty vestibule. There's nothing there, not even Fuminori's shoes, which can only mean that he's still outside somewhere wearing them. The house should be empty. But then what was that voice just now? Why would you go in? Her anger has vanished as if it was never there. Nevertheless, Omi sets foot into the hallway, leaving the door open so that the cowbell won't ring. The floor creaks, setting her nerves on edge. Omi herself isn't sure why she's acting like a burglar. Something tells her to make as little noise as possible. Ponce of the stink inside her of the house makes the whiff she caught. Oh my god. Outside pale in comparison, it's sickening, like rotting fish gusts. Her food bit has food been left spoiled in the kitchen. She hears a bubbling sound up ahead. Stepping gingerly on the creaking floorboards, Omi makes her way to the end of the hallway. She finds rooms to both sides of her, one lit, the other dark, she and chooses to look into the lit room. Oh god. It's the kitchen. Lit by lit by what must be the only window in the house not covered by a storm shutter. The sound she heard was the pot boiling on the stove, and the chopping board next to it lies a butcher's knife and some half stifed carrots. Perfectly normal household scene, with the light of the setting sun making everything the colour of decomposing fruit. Something is wrong. Who is cooking here? And where did they go? Is anyone here? When he calls, regretting it immediately as she realised that her voice is shaking. As her words echo vainly through the silent house, she begins to feel her foolish and defencelessness. Suddenly, she feels something cold seeping through her pantyhose. She timidly reaches down to the touch her feet. Her fingertips come away covered with a viscous 
olive green slime, like the filthy water from a tank long clogged with algae and dead fish. The whole floor is covered with it. Must be the source of the stench. I mean, now wishes that she had worn her shoes inside. Manners be damned. Oh god. When she looks back ruefully the way she came, she realizes that her current position is not visible from the entrance. The kitchen must be where that strange voice came from. Oh god. Hey, we got some slick animation. The next room is probably the den. As she expected from the closed storm shutters, it's pitch black inside. Omni wants nothing more to do than to flee this house. But that would mean turning her back on Tom to the darkness that simply cannot bring her and that she simply cannot bring herself to do. I don't want to continue. It's a save button. Boy, we're getting spooked. <laughs> Moved by some irrational compulsion, Omni sets foot into the den. Why not just walk backwards to the exit? It's too dark to see anything, and the stink is far worse than before. She slides her hand along the wall, feeling for the light switch. Finding it much sooner than she expected, she flips it on like it's her last hope. Colors, colors, so many colors. The purple of entrails, the brown of rotting meat, the crimson of flesh blood, of fresh blood. The yellow of fat, these colors and more that cannot be described covered every inch of the, of the room in maddening array. The colors say all that is needed to be said about the painter's hatred, malice, and insanity. <laughs> Omni's legs give out from the shock, sending her to the floor. Slime immediately soaks through her jeans, its cold tendrils creeping up her leg, crotch, and her neck. Her hand flies to her neck where it's greeted by another drop of chili slime above her. Something is dripping down on her head, making perhaps the worst decision of her life. And he looks up. I don't want to do it. Fuck. The predator clinging to the ceiling, poised to leap upon its prey. She sees it in every detail. Fuck me. Her mouth and nose sealed before she can scream. Her belly is torn open and something enters to feast on her innards. But by the time she feels any of this, Omi has already gone mad. Wow. I bit the bullet and tried to take the train, but the rush hour crowd was so bad that I had to get off halfway and walk. Running pretty late, a sigh of worried. I hope she's not mad. When I enter the yard, I realize that the front door has been left wide open. Light from the living room is seeping out into the hallway, and I hear what sounds like someone smacking their lips. There's also a tantalizing, tantalizing fragrance in the air. Is it Saya? I consider calling out to her, but decide to enter in silence instead. Something smells strange, though not unpleasant. The aroma is quite soothing. In fact, it reminds me of Saya's hair. At first, I'm surprised by what I see in the living room. The floor is covered with what looks like to be some kind of grass, probably the source of the herb-like smell. And there are fruit or vegetable-like balls of varying sizes scattered everywhere. Saya. Saya. Huh. Sai turns around, her eyes wide with surprise, and looks away sheepishly like a child caught at some prank. What are you eating? For some, well, I feel she stammers so flustered that I suddenly feel bad for fuck me, sneaking up on her. Remember that she said she'd never eat in front of me before, realized that she might be quite embarrassed. Can I have one? I scoop up the closest fruit thing, pop it in my mouth, ignoring Sai's attempts to wave me off. A strange texture, soft and pliable. Like a peach or a pear, when I bite into it with my back teeth, a succulent juice fills my mouth. Combined with a strong, with a sharp, strong fragrance, it's unlike anything I've ever tasted. How did you make this? What did you use? It wasn't hard. I just took it apart and melted it a little bit to make it easier to eat. It's practically raw. Mm -hmm. Raw is best. Oh, pick up a different lump. This one consisting of fruity flesh around a hard core. Tearing a chunk off in my mouth, I find it has a similar taste to the last one. Hey, are hey, you okay? That's a... Yeah, even I can eat this. In fact, it's good. Really? First Saya looks dumbstruck, but then she bursts out laughing. So this is what you like. Now feel stupid for going to do all that trouble. Is this is what you always eat, Saya? Yeah, there has been a while since I've had so one so big. Usually catch them in the nearby park. There's an impressive nature preserve not too far from here. I've heard any about fruits like this before, of course. Is that children? Sorry, I already ate the best part. That's okay. As always, next time. And now we can eat together. 
Yeah. So I seems really happy. I'm happy too. Of course. Eating with someone is so much more fun than eating alone and it makes the food taste... She literally eats children. I'm still clean less. It will keep chilled for two or three days though. Though it won't taste as good. Then we better start putting it away. Sealing the small fruits and Tupperware and the large ones in pots and bowls. So I store the remaining food in the refrigerator. Thinking of tomorrow's dinner fills me with anticipation. I feel that little by little. Starting to regain the joy of living. Sai will guide me with her. I can live on.